Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from Telema Press. Gnostic Radio broadcasts free lectures from the Gnostic tradition of Samael on Vior. Each lecture explores another aspect of this timeless and sacred knowledge. Many of these lectures are supported by additional materials available on our website. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live. The live lecture is accompanied by an anonymous chat session allowing listeners to read additional explanations related to the lecture and providing an opportunity to ask questions of the speaker. All of the efforts of Telema Press, including this lecture, are made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Help us to help humanity by making a donation. Telema Press is a non-profit corporation. Donations are tax deductible. For more information, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. Now, the heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures. We begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. of the balance. The symbol of Libra is a set of scales. It's interesting to note that of all of the symbols of the astrological signs, the only one that is mechanical, that is a device, that is not a living thing, are the scales of Libra. The symbol of the balance is presented to represent a fundamental axiom of nature. The nature of equilibrium. Or how forces of nature always seek to balance themselves. We also see, related to the symbol for Libra, that ubiquitous goddess who holds aloft a scale in her hand, which is often used for the sign of justice. On some occasions, this goddess is blindfolded in order to represent the impartial nature of the law. So in these times, if we approach a building of justice, of courts, or of the law, we'll often see this symbol of a woman blindfolded holding aloft a scale or a balance. This sign, the symbol, has very ancient roots and illustrates for us how nature itself manifests and functions, both in the very small scale and the very large scale. Of course, in Gnosis, we constantly emphasize the functionalisms of the law and the many aspects through which the law will work. On the macrocosmic scale, we analyze how the ray of creation unfolds the entire tree of life and each level of the cosmos and how the law stems from that unmanifest into one law, then three, then six, then twelve, and on and on as it descends downward into more and more complex regions of nature, terminating the very bottom of the abyss 
where life is frightfully complicated and dense and painful. But this entire structure is based upon the law of the balance. The entire outpouring of nature, of creation itself, is based in the polarity, the duality of nature, which is represented in the two balances that rest upon the scale. We put into our minds and learn and conceive ideas and theories based upon this dualistic notion of good and evil, light and darkness, growth and decay. And it's true that this duality is the very root of life, the root of death. But this dualistic notion of the mechanism of nature, the function of life, has to be transcended. We study these laws, firstly, to understand them, And secondly, to learn how to extract ourselves from them. And to do that, to transcend the law itself, to step off of the wheel of life and death, requires that we first comprehend that law. We have to be in balance with that law. We have to conquer it. And as we are now, we are grossly out of balance. The imbalance stems and becomes complex due to the nature of our own actions. Our current situation in this very moment, down to the smallest particles of our being, are due to our own actions. The very atoms that make up the physical body that you inhabit have gathered together because of karma. All of the little, tiny little elements, atomic elements, that constitute your existence are coalesced into this entity that you perceive as yourself because of your actions throughout the course of your existences. So in order to change the fundamental experience that you're having now, you have to learn how to change your actions, to change your ways of behavior, your ways of thinking, your ways of feeling. And in this manner, you learn how to work with the scale. Libra is related to Venus, that planet which provides so much of an influence in our lives and in the function of our heart, in the function of our mind. As a goddess of love, Venus provides necessary energies that facilitate our growth and the development of wisdom and understanding. But as a characteristic um, feature, Venus implants into our psyche through the modification provided by the seven rays, which we've discussed in many lectures. Venus provides the virtue of chastity. Now, of course, we tend to relate Venus with love. And naturally, chastity is the highest form of love. But as with any energetic influence, that force can be polarized in the same manner as other influences in nature. So due to our own self-will, due to our imbalance as a psyche, 
we have the tendency to polarize the influences of Venus into the opposite of chastity, which is fornication. And this is the tendency, the desire, the habit to expel the forces of love, to become identified with sensation, to behave as an animal. Libra, as an influence, empowers this axiom, this axis. Libra provides forces, a channel, an influence, which affects our own equilibrium. But particularly in the method or in the means through which we utilize our sexual forces. In other words, a person who's born under the sign of Libra, who is a superior type of person, consciously, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, will be someone who is very chaste, who takes the forces of Venus and Libra in order to strengthen and empower their chastity. But a, an inferior type of Libra, a person who's born under that sign, who's very much in, identified with the ego and addicted to sensation, will be also addicted to fornication, to sexual pleasure, but in an animal way. Naturally, the sign of Libra provides an influence for all creatures. So particularly for those who are interested in transcending suffering and arriving at an equilibrium of the spirit and mind and heart can take advantage of the forces of Libra and Venus in order to utilize the sexual force in the right way. Physiologically, this is accomplished through the energies of the kidneys, Historically, in esotericism, we see that Libra is related to the kidneys. In ancient times, it was understood that the kidneys are related to passion, to emotion, to impulses which push us to behave in certain ways. And that's why the kidneys figure so prominently in many of our ancient scriptures, particularly the Bible or the books of Moses or the books of the prophets and even in the New Testament. It's said throughout the books of Moses and the books of the prophets that God is the one who searches the heart and the kidneys in order to pay what is owed. We know in Gnosis that the heart is related to our emotional center and is very closely related to feelings, to love, to anger, to hate to all the varying types of emotions that we can have, whether superior or inferior. But the kidneys are related as well. When we look at the function of the kidneys, and we take a look at how our physical body is constructed, we can start to see how this is so. In previous lectures, we've talked a lot about the heart and the lungs. Of course, the heart and the lungs work together to cycle the blood through the body, pushing pure blood filled with oxygen throughout all the veins in order to nourish the organism, and then pulling back the impure blood, which has gathered up toxins of the body, in order to revitalize that blood with oxygen and to expel 
the waste elements through the breath. So we see this interchange, this exchange of fire and air, blood, which acts as that intermediary, the carrier of both purity and impurity. So in the action of the heart and lungs, we see a give and take. We see a cycle which repeats constantly so long as we remain alive. This give and take, this coming and going, is again a symbol of the balance of nature. This great cycle, really, of life and death in miniature, which is always happening within the heart. When that blood is flowing back and forth, just below this region of the body, down the spinal column a little ways, we find the kidneys. And of course, the kidneys are a pair of organs which sit on either side of the spinal column. And the kidneys have two primary functions. They clean the blood. They extract impurities. They are part of what we call the excretory system, which is, works closely with the skin. The impurities that the kidneys pull from the blood are then put into water, which is expelled from the organism, from the body through urination. The kidneys have as their second primary function the management of the water in the body. So to remain hydrated, to have the right amount of water in the body is the job of the kidneys, which is a very important function. So you see then that the kidneys have direct physiological importance related to blood and water. Now, if you've studied religion or mysticism, you know that blood and water are ubiquitous symbols in all mystical traditions. Thus, you can see that the kidneys must hide some occult significance. It's very interesting to observe the book of Revelation in the Bible. We've discussed in previous lectures how in chapter 2 of Revelation, when the angel is discussing the nature of the church of Theatira, which is related to the heart. In that verse, the angel says, I am the one who searches the heart and the kidneys, and I give to each one according to his works. So this is an indication that our own karma, our own actions, are measured through the heart and the kidneys. Going a little deeper, we can see how the kidneys have situated on the top of each one the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands have relationships with metabolism, and with some other chemical functions in the body. But they're also closely related with sexuality, with both the development of the sexual organs and the sexual nature of the body as it grows, but also the regulation of the sexual drive. So here we see profound significance, that the kidneys, in conjunction with the adrenal glands, have a direct bearing on our sexual health, our sexual development, the health of our blood, the health of our entire body because of the water. Now, of course, in Gnosticism, we always indicate that water is a symbol of sexual energy. We always discuss the sexual waters. And we know that in the Bible, in the Popol Vuh, in uh, many of the ancient stories, in Hinduism, the water 
or the womb is the symbol of the great sexual chaos from which all creation emerges. Our own physical body emerged out of that marvelous magical water which was the um, interconnection of a man and a woman who combined their sexual waters which produced the marriage, the union of an egg and a sperm in that watery darkness of the womb. Venus, of course, has a role here. Venus is also related to the kidneys. And if you've studied Paracelsus, you know that Paracelsus praises greatly the powers that Venus has through the kidneys to influence conception, to influence the development of the organism. And of course, Venus is always present in the union of a man and a woman. Venus is the goddess of love. So here in the kidneys, we are measured. And you can see how the kidneys sit in the body like the scales of a balance. In fact, if you look at the structure of the anatomy and compare it with the structure of a scale, you could see that the rod that the scale sits upon would be the spinal column. The, the balancing beam that holds the kidneys would cross at the heart. And the kidneys hang off either end of that balance. The top of the beam would be the brain, the head. But these two beams, one vertical, one horizontal, cross in the heart. This is cause for meditation. To comprehend the profound significance of the way that our body was created. The symbolism that is present in the organization of our very organs. So the Bible states many times that we are measured in the heart and the kidneys. In the book of Psalms, there are many appearances of this relationship between the kidneys and the heart. In Psalm 7-9, it says, Let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God trieth the heart and the kidneys. In in, uh, Psalm 16, it's written, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My kidneys also instruct me during the night. And in 26, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my kidneys and my heart. But perhaps the most beautiful example is in Psalm 139. It's written, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uppermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast created my kidneys. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. This passage contains enormous significance in relation to the sign of Libra. Firstly, because the writer, the prophet, is directly indicating how God, our own spirit, works through our kidneys.
and assigns particular significance to that. But also, the writer indicates that from the point of view of God, night and day are the same. God is always there, in light and darkness. But this has to be understood in context. This is a symbol of how the balance works. From the point of view of the Spirit, there is equanimity. God perceives the interchange of light and dark, day and night, without being identified, maintaining that perfect balance, that equilibrium between good and bad, between up and down, between day and night. We don't. We get caught having preferences for one side of the pendulum or the other. It's said that disequilibrium arises because of desire. But desire has to be understood as having two aspects. There is the desire to get something, to acquire something, to have something. That could be a sensation that we want. The other aspect of desire is the desire to avoid something. So here we see this pendulum, two sides of really the same phenomenon. craving and aversion. For and against. Day and night. Pleasure and pain. Life and death. Growth and decay. Due to desire, we fall into ignorance. We become attached to certain states of being, to certain experiences of sensation. And due to that attachment, we want to sustain it. What is the nature of lust? It is the desire to sustain a sensation. What is the nature of anger? It is the desire to inflict and sustain a sensation. What is pride? It is the desire to sustain a sensation in the heart, in the mind, in the body. The ego exists because we created it by becoming identified with sensations. What we fail to realize is that each instant of being identified with any sensation, we create matter. In the moment when someone makes fun of us, tells a joke, ridicules some behavior or some action that we took, And we feel the pain. If in that instant, we become identified with that pain. In other words, we believe it. We empower it. We give it energy. We feel that pain and say, God, why did they say that? How could they do this to me? What is everyone going to think? And pain blossoms in the heart like a flower of hell. And we, by observing that, by cultivating that feeling, by investing our thoughts and our feelings and our actions into the demands of that pain, create matter. There is a creation that ensues. 
the forces and energies which have been given to us by God, which descend into our three nervous systems and cycle and process through our three brains, create, because that is the nature of the law of three. We know we have the intellectual brain. We have the emotional brain. We have the motor instinctive sexual brain. These three channel those energies of the three forces. When we become identified with that experience of being criticized and feeling our pride get hurt, those energies become destructive. They create, but in hell, our own psychological hell in the depths of our own mind. What results is a formation inside the subconsciousness or the unconsciousness or the infraconsciousness. An entity, a vessel. That vessel, in its very nature, has that pride. The anger, the trauma, those hurt feelings, the will for revenge, the will for justice. Justice. Libra. The forces that we channel through us, through ourselves from moment to moment, are creative. But we have to use them in the right way. That entity which we've created in the mind is karma. That formation can only behave according to the root of its formation. In other words, anger can only create anger. Anger can only feed anger. Anger can only perform what anger can perform. In other words, within the context of our own submerged mind are a multitude of elements which can only behave in prescribed ways according to their nature, according to how we made them. In other words, our mind is conditioned. It's conditioned by pride, by anger, by lust, by envy, gluttony, greed, hate. Fortunately, the answer to solve the problem is also in our hands. The same forces that we use to create our own suffering, to create our own traumas, to create our own prison, can also be utilized to destroy that prison, to break the jail of our own mind. The problem becomes recognizing that the house we live in is actually a prison. After centuries of becoming accustomed to certain modes of behavior, we've grown to think it's normal. We've become so habituated to existing within the confines of pride and lust that we think it's normal. It's not. In fact, it is abnormal. To change the situation depends upon learning how to use our energies from moment to moment in the right way we have to reach a state of equilibrium. In the process of creating these blocks, these bottles within which our psyche is trapped, we become identified with one or another of our three brains.
in the example of being criticized, we may have the predisposition to always view life from the point of view of our feelings. In other words, we have a psychological limp that is a sort of filter or a pair of glasses through which we always observe the experiences of life. And as such, we gauge and measure our experience of life through the heart. But we ignore or blind to the other two brains, the intellect and the motor instinctive sexual brain. This is a state of disequilibrium. The type of person who has this psychological limp will always do things and judge things and act based upon how they feel. Contradicting that is the intellectual type of person who will always judge things and base their actions on ideas, on reasoning. And that is their particular idiosyncratic psychological limp. And then you have the type of person who always sees life through their motor instinctive sexual brain. This type of person reacts quickly, without thought, without even knowing how they feel about it, but on impulse. This type has the most difficulty because they tend to behave in life in such a reactive and rapid way that they don't even realize what they're doing until it's too late. We all have all three of these tendencies, all of us, but we tend towards one more than the others, and we're blind to that. This is a form of psychological disequilibrium, and it's this imbalance which causes us to again and again react and act in the wrong way. In other words, we misinterpret we misinform ourselves. We mistake life. To learn how to act properly, to learn how to perform right action, requires that we learn to rely on the being, on our own God, on our spirit. And he communicates to us through intuition. Little, hut, little hints, little nudges, what we would call a hunch or a feeling, a sense of what's right. Unfortunately, when we receive those hunches, those nudges, we tend to immediately fall back into our psychological disequilibrium. The intellectual person will begin to reason to compare that intuition, to say, well, I kind of feel like I should do this, but there are all these things against it. Now, th these things are for it, but all these other things are against it, so they become confused. The emotional person will react from feelings. Oh, I'm scared to do that. It doesn't feel right. What will happen? Fear, worry, anxiety. The instinctive person will react based on the circumstances. Not even realizing what they're doing. And then later they'll think, oh, you know, I knew better. I knew I shouldn't have done that. But I did it anyway. To rely on intuition requires that we learn how to work with the consciousness how to observe ourselves, how to remember ourselves. And really, the balance, the practice, the experience of self-observation and self-remembering develops when we understand the three brains, when we can separate ourselves from the three brains, when we can equilibrate them. In other words, from moment to moment, we observe the three brains. We watch them. So as you have experiences from moment to moment, you always maintain awareness. What are these impressions that are arriving producing in me as thoughts? 
what feelings are arising, what impulses are arising. And then we consciously watch and wait. The goal is to not simply react to the occurrences of life. It is instead to comprehend them and upon the basis of comprehension to then act in the right way. Some people ask, what exactly is a paramartha satya? This term refers to the highest potential state of self-realization that exists. This is a person who has absolute conscious knowledge. And really, a paramartha satya is a person who has perfected right action in their three brains. Who has absolute conscious knowledge of the will of God. And this is accomplished by beginning where we are. Learning about ourselves. This is not some distant goal that we should have ambition for. It is a natural state of being that any creature can arrive to through self-analysis, through self-understanding, through wisdom. On a more subtle level, we would say that a paramartha satya is someone who has balanced the three gunas. And as you'll recall from previous lectures, the three gunas are three qualities, three characteristics of root matter or root nature, prakriti. The three gunas are called sattva, rajas, and tamas. Sattva, of course, is related to truth or wisdom. It is that quality of what we would say goodness. Rajas is the quality of passion or activity, energy, maybe even desire. And tamas is related to inertia or ignorance. And of course, each one of these is related to our three brains as well. The sattvic guna related to the intellect. The rajasic guna related to the emotion. The tamasic guna related to the motor instinctive sexual brain. So a paramatha satya has balanced these three characteristics of the prakriti in himself. We begin that by learning about our three brains and learning how to control them consciously. This effort is in the consciousness, not the mind, not the heart, not in impulse, not in motor behaviors. In other words, acquired habits. We, as the creatures that we are, tend to learn by imitation. We imitate others. This is a function of the motor instinctive sexual brain. There's nothing wrong with that. As children, we need it to grow and survive. And as Gnostic students, we imitate in order to learn from our instructors, to learn from each other. But self-observation, self-remembering, cannot be learned through imitation. It's learned through action, through actually performing something inside. There is no physical evidence of self-observation and self-remembering. There's no emotional evidence. There's no intellectual evidence. Because each of the three brains is a machine that transforms energy. Self-observation is a conscious transformation of energy. Self-remembering is a conscious transformation of energy. When the consciousness is present and active, all the impressions that arrive are being transformed by the consciousness. 
Now, in us, this is a little bit relative because we are 97% trapped in ego, in desire. So even if we make that strong effort to observe ourselves, to remember ourselves, to be present and watchful, we're still only using 3% of our potential. And that's if we're trying. If we're not trying to self-remember and self-observe, then we are asleep. And being asleep, all the energies that are arriving into us in the form of impressions are being transformed negatively. In other words, deepening suffering. Filling up the mind with improperly transformed impressions. So the effort to be conscious, to self-observe, to self-remember, is critical. It is that first doorway to develop the soul. It's essential. It's irreplaceable. It cannot be avoided. And if it's avoided, there can be no self-realization. When the consciousness is present, we start to transform energy in the right way, to transform impressions from moment to moment. We start to equilibrate. Because in order to really observe oneself, you have to understand the function of your mind. You have to understand the function of your heart. Because it's these functions that prevent you from observing yourself. Habitual functions. Habits. Desires. Passions. We observe ourselves. We observe what makes us sleep psychologically. Little by little, we identify those elements which produce sleep in our psyche. and We disempower them. We may discover that there's a certain friend that we have that whenever we talk to this friend, we get into these boiling conversations within which we always forget ourselves. We become so identified with those conversations that we completely forget to observe ourselves. One day, we realize it. And then we start to make effort. When we see that friend, we say, oh, I've got to remember myself. I have to observe myself. Still have the conversation, but not forget. This is a beautiful moment. A beautiful opportunity to change the nature of suffering in yourself. And believe it or not, for that friend too. Because when you become conscious, you irradiate a different kind of energy that influences people on levels they don't perceive. This effort is essential. Little by little, from event to event, from moment to moment, transforming energy. And of course, in that observation of ourselves, we'll probably see how there's certain aspects of the conversations that repeat. There are repetitions that are happening. If we meditate on that experience and we sincerely begin to investigate it, we will discover that that repetition has a history from the past. And little by little, event from event from event, we begin to see and understand that our entire life is a repetition. Every event, every circumstance, every problem is repeated. And that's because the elements that exist in our mind can only behave in the manner in which they were created. The 97% which traps the consciousness are elements that recur, which repeat themselves. This is how we can understand people who seem to know what's going to happen. Most of the time, it's because they've already done it in a previous existence. They've already experienced it. And they're just repeating the same thing. But 
a little more complicated each time. Because each time a cycle repeats, new actions are added, new complications. Here you can see and understand something about the cycle of life and death. If we start in a given moment with a clean slate, but we become identified with a particular element, let's say pride, we don't comprehend that pride. We build a little pride because someone praises us. So we then created a little element in the mind related to pride, what we would call an ego or an I. That element resides in the mind and traps consciousness, traps energy. But it has to act. It wants food. It's an entity like any, which is part of nature. A false creation, but nonetheless, it is there. That entity will constantly be seeking food to nourish itself, to grow, like anything in nature. But as our own child, it wants food from us. We created it. So it will arise when it's stimulated by impressions. Someone else comes and praises us. That little element says, oh, food for me. Then we start to seek situations to receive praise. We start to want to repeat that sensation of feeling good about ourselves because we think someone else loves us. But really, it's pride. So we begin to repeat those circumstances, to seek out those situations in order to feed that feeling of importance. Each time, that element gets a little more fat, a little stronger. We might die physically, but that element still exists in the mind. And when we take a new body, that element is there, hungry, ready for food. So it drives us to seek those situations to feed it. And this continues from existence to existence. What we don't realize is that there is a limit on the weight that nature can sustain. In the same way that a disease eventually will kill an organism, the ego will eventually kill us as a soul, as an embryo of soul. So as that entity gets fatter and fatter, it starts to devolve and degenerate faster and faster, pulling us more and more to feed it, to make it heavier and heavier and heavier, until eventually, in this level of nature, it cannot be sustained. It has to sink into more laws, deeper. And then, of course, it carries our consciousness with it into hell. This is how we create our own suffering. We don't do this with just pride. We do it with millions of impressions from moment to moment. Being asleep, behaving mechanically, automatically, reacting habitually. We deepen suffering. Now, this cycle is symbolized in all the different religions in different ways. But we can see that the circle here has two fundamental halves, evolution and devolution. To evolve, an any element is born and grows and it is, a, is in an upward swing of progressive development. In other words, that simple form, which is born, becomes more complex. The great poet Rumi illustrated this beautifully when he discussed the evolution of the soul. He wrote in a poem, I died as a mineral and became a plant. 
I died as a plant and rose to an animal. I died as an animal and I became a man. I'll continue with the rest of that poem a little bit later. But what we see here are these fundamental kingdoms of nature. Our embryo soul, the essence that we have, that little particle of God, enters into manifestation through the mineral kingdom. That little spark has to grow and develop itself through those kingdoms of the minerals. And it becomes successively more complex as it grows and gathers understanding. It develops itself. And this occurs over a long period of time. But when that mineral vessel has developed the highest possible complication in that level of nature, then the soul which inhabits inhabits that essence dies, in other words, to that kingdom. It graduates and moves on to the plant kingdom. Then that soul essence, the burata, grows and develops itself through the plant kingdom from very simple plants, successively, little by little, into more and more complex ones, all the while gathering knowledge, understanding, wisdom, learning how to act in balance with nature. This is the purpose. But in each level, with more complex means. The body becomes more complicated, and the laws which govern it become more subtle, more sophisticated. Then, when that soul essence has reached the maximum level of development in that plant kingdom, it graduates and is born into the animal kingdom, and the same process ensues. But here there's a difference. At the peak of the development of that soul essence in the animal kingdom, with grave warnings, that soul essence is given a new capacity Reasoning. It is still an animal. It is an animal soul. But it's given reasoning so that it can perfect itself and graduate into the human kingdom. But to do that, there has to be a revolution. You see here how the soul essence evolves according to the mechanical aspects of nature up the cycle of life. Upon entrance into the humanoid kingdom, in other words, the intellectual animal kingdom, that soul essence receives reasoning and is told, now you have to become a conqueror of nature, a king and queen of nature, which means you have to conquer your animal mind and become human. In other words, to become a real human being, which in uh, classical terms we call an angel. An angel is a real human being. This is a soul essence that has become soul, that has conquered the animal mind. And what is the animal mind? Desire. When that animal mind enters into the humanoid level and receives reasoning, it has to learn to deal with sensations and impressions on its own. In the animal kingdom, we received guidance from those devas and angels who guide the animals and who lead them in their path of progressive development. When we enter into the human kingdom, we're given the gift of reasoning so that we can develop individual will. All the lower kingdoms have collective will, collective mind. This is why we see them moving in packs and herds and groups. The intellectual animals still move in groups and packs and herds, but we think we're individuals. We're not. We only do what is accepted by the rest of our group. And we will defend the ideas and beliefs of our group to the death, even if they're wrong. Because that group collective mind is so strong in us. But to become an angel... To become a real individual, we have to conquer the collective mind, which is within. 
and develop individual will. Unfortunately, when this current humanity entered into the intellectual animal kingdom, we made a lot of mistakes. We became identified with sensation, with desire. And the result is the ego. The result is this humanity that you see now, which kills for beliefs, which kills for money, money which has no real significance or importance, no real value, just paper. We kill for it. Some people kill on a whim. Some people kill with just the mind, with bad ideas, harmful ideas. Some kill with the heart, with negative emotion. And killing is just one way that we demonstrate our animal nature. We also fornicate, which is an animal behavior. Angels do not fornicate. Angels are perfecting chastity. Angels obey the laws of the Garden of Eden, which is to work with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but to not eat its fruit. To become a human being, we develop individual will. And that will begins when we learn how to transform impressions. But what fuels that? How can we transform impressions in the state that we are in? It takes enormous energy to create something. The creation of a human organism requires a tremendous power a tremendous force. And of course, that force is sexual energy. In the occult traditions or those, the esoteric traditions of humanity, it's often stated, the more subtle an energy, the more powerful it is. And if you observe yourself, what is the most powerful energy in you? What force that is within you can produce the most dramatic changes? Well, some would say it's the mind. Some would say your manner of thinking produces the change, the biggest changes. Some would say it's emotion, it's feelings. Some would say it's instinct, fight or flight, survival, those types of things. But you see in each of these points of view a psychological limp. In reality, the most potent energy that is within your body in this moment is the sexual force. There is no force with more power. No power to move and shake your life. And if you look deeply in yourself, you'll see that. You can do all kinds of actions with mental energy which can produce some result. You can perform all kinds of action with emotional energy, which will produce some result. And you can do things physically, which will produce some result. But you can have the sexual act one time and change your life forever. You can have children. You can contract a disease. You could fall in love. The sexual energy has those powers to push us back and forth to produce action, to produce consequences greater than any other force. Therein, in the sexual energy, is the key to redemption. Some uh, religions, some systems, repeat this idea that there are many paths which lead to God. But Jesus stated there's one. There's one door, one gate, and it's very narrow, and very few find it. And that door, that gate, is covered by a stone. The stone upon which the temple has to be built, the foundation stone. And that stone is the sexual organs, the sexual force, the sexual energy, the mercury that watery stone 
the element which is both a stone and a liquid. It is a metal. It is the sexual force. We have to develop the strength of will to chisel that stone and make it perfect, which is what the Masons pursue in their ancient ideal. This means we need to use the sexual force in the right way. To take that energy and use it properly. And this, of course, is closely related with the heart, with the kidneys. In Chinese medicine, if someone is losing vitality or having have a lack of energy, they are given medicine for the kidneys. And this is because the kidneys are closely related with the management of the sexual force. Even in Western medicine nowadays, people who have kidney problems are often advised to observe abstinence. Now, of course, the doctors of both traditions will never state that you should save your sexual energy exclusively because they don't do it. In fact, they'll tell you, if you save your sexual energy, it will hurt you. But they don't know that. Science, as an ideal, states that we should experiment and verify through practical facts what is and is not. And all the doctors push for fornication and reject chastity, and yet they don't practice it. So how do they know? By practicing chastity, by saving the sexual energy, we vitalize the kidneys. We gather great forces which strengthen and harmonize the kidneys, which in turn vitalizes our organism, empowers our entire endocrine system, feeds the brain with pure energy, develops the heart with the forces of love. The angel is the outcome of the transformation of sexual energy. The self-realized soul is an outcome, is born from chastity. This is the great gift that Libra can assist us with, to give us the force and energy to help us become chaste, to have chastity. But we don't have much time. The cycle of evolution and devolution has a limit. You'll observe that in the traditional Catholic and Buddhist and Hindu rosaries, they have 108 beads. When a devotee of Buddhism visits an ancient site, they will walk 108 times around that holy site. And this is a symbol of the 108 lifetimes that each embryo soul is given when it enters into the human kingdom, the humanoid kingdom, rather. We have 108 opportunities to understand the mind, to develop the soul. And humanity, having been born out of the animal kingdom, moves in groups, as the animals do, until we escape that animal nature. So this vast wave of humanity, this big group of animal intellectuals, is approaching the end of the 108 lifetimes. In other words, a key moment in this current age is about to arrive. When this particular wave of soul embryos will lose their opportunity to develop further. The karma, the ego, has become so heavy that the souls are already abandoning the use of humanoid bodies and entering into devolution down that great wheel to become simple again. You see, the top of the wheel is the maximum level of complication that mechanical nature can sustain. And as our mind becomes more complicated, as our karma becomes more complicated, 
as the soul becomes more trapped. God, in his infinite love, has given us hell to free the soul from that complication. You could say it's a punishment, and it is, in order to teach the soul to not make those mistakes. So little by little, those soul embryos who fail to self-realize themselves will enter into those devolving cycles down the wheel of life, down the wheel of life and death, the wheel of samsara, in order to be simplified for those forces and pressures of nature to destroy the ego for us. But this is very painful. If you think in this moment it's painful to look inside and see your traumas, to see your pains, to see your sufferings, magnify that and extend it. Because that's what hell is. The process of a soul embryo being recycled through nature is the process of that soul embryo confronting all of its traumas and pains and mistakes to learn from them. Unfortunately, that understanding does not develop into anything. To be freed of those mistakes through hell does not develop that soul. It returns to its point of departure. It goes back to the state that it started in. No better off. With only the opportunity to repeat it again, to try once more. It's said that at the end of that cycle, after thousands of years and thousands of existences being recycled through nature and through all that unimaginable pain, at the very end, when the last little element is removed and that little embryo is perfected once more, then that soul is even with the law of karma. The debts are paid. But that soul is no closer to awakening, to enlightenment. It starts over. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, that great Christ, the avatar that the Christ spoke through, says this, They, the evil, cruel, and ungrateful, I cast them perpetually into the asuric wombs, demonic wombs, in order for them to be born into these infernal worlds. Those hallucinated people enter into the demonic wombs again and again, continually falling into increasingly inferior bodies. Triple is the door of that destructive inferno. It is made up of lust, anger, and covetousness. That is why these must be abandoned. This is a practical reality. This is not a theory. When you have nightmares, you're visiting those worlds because you have elements that belong there. Your mind is there. Your consciousness is trapped in it. We have to revolt against ourselves. The great rebellion... The great revolution is inside. All the wars, all the battles of the Bible, of all the scriptures, are symbolic of the war we have to wage against our own mind. To revolt against our pride, our lust, and all of our evilness in order to free ourselves from this law of 108 lives. And that's accomplished by using the sexual energy in the right way to transform impressions, to comprehend the mind, and to build the soul. In the poem by Rumi, he says, when he became a man, why should I fear? When was I less by dying? 
We have all died hundreds and thousands of times. Death is simply a change of clothing for the soul. We've passed from existence to existence. But what is sad is we fail to realize that each existence is a repetition of the one before with slight differences. We have a new personality in each life. We have new circumstances, but they're all rooted in karma. They're all rooted in our own actions in the previous life. We have to revolt against that repetition. Each event that arises in our life, we have to comprehend. To receive it consciously, to observe our three brains, and analyze every thought, every feeling, every impulse, whether good or bad, whether pleasant or unpleasant. We have to meditate on that. Even if we have an experience in life that makes us feel very good about ourselves, it can lead to suffering because we become identified with those sensations. Experiences that make us feel bad about ourselves can lead to suffering when we become identified with those sensations. The nature of psychological equilibrium is to be the same in all experiences of life. To be in equanimity. To be serene. Only the consciousness can accomplish that. Because only God can provide real serenity. The mind can fake it. The mind can fake serenity and put on a serene face and act calm, but in the depths there is boiling. We have to understand in ourselves how to be sincere. To fake behaviors is to deceive not only other people but ourselves, which is a crime against our own inner God. Be honest with yourself. Look closely at how you deceive yourself from day to day. In particular, any time you blame someone else, you're wrong. The cause of all of your problems are within you, not outside. You cannot say that your friend made you angry. Because if you did not have anger, you wouldn't be angry. Your own anger makes you angry. That anger may be stimulated by impressions, by words, or by action, but it is your anger. And that's not the responsibility of anyone else but you. It's good to take responsibility for that. To recognize the nature of every experience is self-originated. So Rumi continues, Why should I fear? When was I less by dying? Yet once more I shall die as man to soar with angels blessed. We have to understand here that he's not talking about a man the way we think of it. He's talking about a real man, a real human being, someone who has born, given birth to the soul. Even that must die. Even the angel has to die in himself to advance. And Rumi says that. But even from angelhood, I must pass on. All except God perishes. When I have sacrificed my angel soul, I shall become what no mind ever conceived. Oh, let me not exist. For non-existence proclaims in organ tones, to him shall we return. The stellar influence of Libra can assist us in that process by providing us with a balancing influence in the psyche, in the kidneys, in the heart, in the mind. The scale can also represent the balance of heart and mind. When you look at Anubis in the Book of the Dead, he has a feather and a jar. The jar holds the heart. The feather is the mind. These two have to be in perfect balance in us. We have to learn 
to think with the heart and feel with the head in order to receive intuition, the guidance of the being. These aspects have to be balanced. That state of equilibrium is the point of departure for the creation of the soul. In other words, if you don't have psychological balance, if you don't have the capacity to consciously control your three brains, then how is God going to give you power? How can God give you the kundalini if you cannot control the energies that are inside? In that sense, we can say our own God is somewhat like a parent who's watching his child. And how does he observe and measure his child? Through the heart and the kidneys. Of course, the heart is where we have our feelings, our will, our intention. And in the kidneys, we have our chastity or our lust. So our own inner God measures us in this way. And when we've received or when we've established this psychological equilibrium in ourselves, learning how to be conscious of our three brains, to consciously control our psyche. This does not mean the ego is eliminated. It means we're developing the capacity to be in a state of self-observation and self-remembering from moment to moment. We're developing the will to not be ruled by the mind, by the ego, by desire. Then... If we're practicing chastity, if we're working with a spouse, if we're transforming our sexual energies, then that divine intelligence of the Holy Spirit can give us that profound gift of the awakening of the Kundalini. But only then. That fire can then be raised through the, each body, the soul. And in that process, create the soul. Then we become a real human being. In other words, a real man. But our problems don't stop there. The creation of the soul is not the elimination of the ego. To create the soul is to create a vessel through which God can work. That soul, that vessel is necessary in these times because the ego is so heavy and so complex. We need a high voltage transmitter to direct our sexual forces in an extremely potent and forceful way by the guidance of the Divine Mother to eliminate the ego. If you're single, you can still do it. You can make enormous progress as a single person working on your own, transmuting your sexual energy. But someone who's in a couple has a lot more energy available. And when they develop the bodies, they have even more. And they develop the soul. The danger also increases. In the same way that we use these energies in the wrong way to create ego, when we don't have the bodies, when we don't have the fire, we can still do that when we have them. Just because you've created, let's say, the solar astral body does not mean that you are free from making mistakes. In fact, for you, your situation is even more delicate. The form and function of the solar astral body is a great current, a great capacitor, which can direct enormous forces. But if you are listening to the demon of the heart, that demon, with his ill will, who wants to hurt others, you can inflict terrible damage and accrue terrible karma. So these bodies are not just beautiful gifts without consequences. To receive them implies an enormous responsibility. And great care has to be taken. If we allow thoughts of resentment or anger or envy to process in our psyche. This is bad. It's harmful for ourselves and others. But if we're transmuting our sexual energy, it's even worse because those sexual forces are more powerful 
than in someone who's fornicating. And that means that anger, that resentment, that envy has more force and can produce more harm. Likewise, if you're transmuting the energy and you have the solar astral body or the solar mental body or the solar causal body, even more force, even more potential harm. Because these bodies are transformers of energy, but they, are, they transform by will. Those initiates who create the soul, who elaborate the solar bodies, but do not eliminate the ego, are called Hannes Musen. And this is a term from Arabic that means someone with a double center of gravity. They have some development in the soul, which is the upper part. In other words, the soul related to the master, the spirit. And then they have a lower part, which is the ego. And these two centers of gravity are in constant conflict trying to control that human soul. So when someone has created the solar bodies, they actually are in the middle of an even greater conflict because there's enormous power there that God needs, but the ego wants. Yeah, that is the great battle. That's why we read about the Pandavas. Krishna guides the Pandavas, those brothers, which are the soul. And they have to battle against the blind king and his legions, which is the ego. The Master Samael gives many examples of this. In particular, he mentions Andromalek. Andromalek, as a spirit, as a master, is a great master. The inner god, Andromalek, is a great master with a great deal of development and a lot of beauty. But his human soul is a demon. The human soul of Andromalek did not destroy the ego. Created the solar bodies, but didn't destroy the ego and accrued so much karma and persisted in so many bad habits the Master Samuel states in his investigations he discovered Andra Malek, the master divorced himself from his human soul he released it and that human soul cannot return to his master until the ego is destroyed through devolution. So that means that that master of Andromalek, the inner spirit, cannot take a new physical body for millions of years until that human soul has passed through the process of devolution and has become pure again. That is a grave situation. That human soul within its solar bodies, has to enter into hell. At this time, he's working consciously as a demon to try to harm others. But at a certain point, karma will take him and he will devolve for a long time. If we, without solar bodies, take thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, the solar bodies don't belong to nature. They are of a form and substance that is outside of the womb of Mother Nature. They are extremely durable. And it will take nature a long time to break it down. A very crude example would be a piece of plastic that you throw into a, a garbage dump is not going to break down for hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe longer, years. Things that belong to nature, like banana peels and Things like that will break down quickly. It's a similar analogy. The solar bodies take a long time. This is why we always emphasize it is necessary to transmute the sexual energy. Yes. It is necessary to create the soul, of course. But we always have to work on the ego every day 
to whatever our capacity is. To always analyze ourselves, to look at ourselves, to be sincere, to look for the things that need to change. We need to take the power that God gives us, all the energies, and use them in the right way. If we abuse it, if we abuse the energies that we have, then we have to bear those consequences. An example, nowadays, it's becoming very, very common for people to take drugs to give them more sexual power. Why is that? Why are these drugs necessary now? Why are men and women losing the sexual drive? Why are they losing the capacity, which is normal in the average person? Why is it necessary for people to take chemicals to stimulate the sexual energy? It's because of abuse. Because of so much abuse of sexual energy, they have wasted it. Now they take pills to steal energy from other parts of the body, to falsely stimulate the sexual drive. And this drains the organism even faster. It's an abuse of the endocrine system and other vital organisms within our organism. What do they call that? Well, now they call it erectile dysfunction because they don't want to use what it really is, impotence. Because people have a trauma about that word. They don't want to use that word. So they call it other things, kind of scientific-sounding things. But the word impotence means impotent, to have no potency, to have no power. To misuse the sexual energy, of course, happens physically through fornication of the body. But we misuse the sexual energy in the heart through desire. We misuse the sexual energy in the intellect through desire. False negative imagery, fantasy, is a waste of sexual energy. The first cause of impotence is that we feed too much energy into false mechanical imagination. Most men who face and deal with impotence have developed too much sexual fantasy in the mind and thus have created a conflict in their psyche through fantasy, through imagining the sexual act rather than actually performing it. So what happens is when they come to the moment of actually performing the sexual act, they can't because all that energy is trapped in false creations in the mind. The same happens with women, but emotional and mental in everyone. The potency, the power that we need comes from chastity. To transmute the sexual forces is to save them and transform them consciously with the assistance of God. Those forces transform the individual on every level. If that energy is the most powerful motivator in life, and it is, that is also the most powerful key for spiritual development. Instead of using that sexual force to fulfill desire, to chase after our dreams, we can use that energy to create the soul and to destroy the ego and thus reach liberation, freedom. This is all in the house of Libra. Libra provides the guidance, the equilibrium, the balance. But it requires a great effort in all three brains managed by the consciousness. We have to have equanimity, We have to have a good heart. And we have to be humble. The natives of Libra, of course, are getting a a little extra influence from this sign. So we can see in them a particular kind of dynamic energy and a particular attention to justice. The Libra types are very much concerned with justice. In fact, they can be be so focused on justice, they can forget mercy, and they can seem cruel. The superior type of Libra 
is able to receive the balance, the influence of that balance, as a kind of serenity or equanimity, which gives them the natural predisposition to avoid the limelight, to remain anonymous, to do good works, but to remain anonymous. But the inferior type always seeks recognition. So there are, you can see in the superior transformation of the influence of Libra that it naturally provides qualities that are necessary to develop the soul. But in the inferior type, it provides qualities to push the soul to degenerate. Are there any questions? Yes? No, I stated that the master cannot. The human soul, the demon, can take physical bodies. That's what the master stated in his book. Right, so in, in, in some point recently, Andromalek had a physical body, but Andromalek, the fallen human soul, had a physical body in China. That's not the master. That isn't the human, the, the divine soul and the innermost. That is the human soul who has fallen, who took a body. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. The soul is trapped in the ego. So the ego, in order for the ego to be removed and the soul to be purified, the soul has to be there. That soul essence has to be there. Your question? Is the, uh, the devolution, the downward start of that cycle, is that related to uh, the second death? The second death is the completion of devolution. The very last moments is what we call the second death, what the Bible calls the second death. And it's the final moments of having that ego removed, which is very painful. And then it always starts over. Right. So once the second death is complete, that soul embryo then returns back into the mineral kingdom and begins to take new bodies in order to start the whole cycle again. This is why we state that the soul embryo returns from body to body, repeats. The term reincarnate implies conscious will. So strictly speaking, only someone who's developed the soul and built that vehicle and has awakened consciousness can choose to incarnate, or in other words, reincarnate. And that's also part of the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna states that, that only the gods and titans, the developed soul, can choose its incarnations. Otherwise, we just return, repeat. Yes? And through... Um Yeah. The remembrance of past existences is a necessity. It's important. And the reason is so that we can see how behaviors that we're trapped in now began, how we created them. Self-observation and self-remembering focus and channel the, the consciousness to be present which gives us the capacity to perceive ourselves as we really are in the moment. Of course, to see yourself as you really are takes a lot of consciousness. Right now, we just see ourselves in a very vague way, vaporous. It's very difficult to see ourselves as we really are. But as that sense deepens and becomes stronger, more consistent, intuition can bring more information. So you may see yourself performing a certain behavior or feeling a certain way today. 
And your intuition may bring you a hunch. Oh, that's related to something that happened at this time in the past. And yes, those memories can extend back beyond your present physical birth. But that's a matter of development. You also should not take those things at face value because the mind can easily deceive you. You always have to meditate. It's true. Yeah, it's true. The more you start to comprehend about the nature of your own mind, the more understanding that brings. And that's not intellectual. You couldn't necessarily say, oh, well, I have this karma, this ego, because this and this and this and this. It isn't an intellectual outline. In fact, the connections can seem quite unconnected. When you meditate on given events, you may start to see related elements that on the surface appear to have no relationship at all. And your intellect will become bewildered because it always looks for A to B to C, right? Very literal. The ego is a mess. The ego is hugely complicated. That's another reason why we need the consciousness in order to navigate that. The intellect simply is not capable. So the problem arises because we rely on the intellect so much that we want to label each element in the mind with a certain name to say, oh, that's pride. Then we think we understand it. We don't. That's just a label. That element has many characteristics. Each element in the mind has three brains. It has its own thoughts, its own feelings, and its own will to act. And it's related to other ones because of the nature of each situation, each particular karma. The mind, the intellect, cannot grasp that. It's so complex and so deep, and it's been happening for hundreds of opportunities across thousands of moments, across many existences. And the mind, the intellect, simply cannot hold that. It's a simple little tool. But the being can do it. The wisdom of the being and the depth and power of the consciousness can understand that and penetrate it. So that's, again, we have to always return to that. Observe it. Understand it intuitively with the consciousness. And then the real comprehension happens. And as you state, it's true that there's a sort of release that will happen. We start to have some acceptance, some contentment, a peace. When you comprehend an ego, when you really understand an ego, you start to become free of it. And what's natural there is that consciousness starts to be extracted, which returns to us. And what is the consciousness but equanimity, peace? and joy, and love, and all the virtues of the being. So it's a beautiful thing, but it requires a lot of work. Yes? Uh, what are some concerns for people born on this planet of Libra, and what are some exercises? Well, the Master Samael teaches an exercise related to Libra, in which we stand in the form of a scale, straight up, with the arms out, and we bend at the waist from side to side. And we visualize and imagine the forces rising through the earth up into us related to the kidneys and helping us to learn to transform energy in the right way. And this all should be accompanied by prayer, having a meditative state. Um, the natives of Libra, the master mentions many things. He states that the Libra person See, I'm just going to read you a little bit from what the Master said. They have the defect of not knowing how to forgive. And this is that sense of justice that the Libra person tends to have. So they also need to learn a little bit about diplomacy and to... Um, learn about the contradictions in others. A Libra person cannot deal with seeing two faces in you. So if you come at them with cruelty or like kind of harshness, and then the next day you're sweet, they don't like that. In fact, they will shut you out. And that's a defect that they have of expecting a kind of consistency or balance. So there are other qualities, but I think it's better to focus instead on the more um, 
universal applications of the sign. Yes? Can you say a bit more about the phrase, think with the heart and feel with the head? I've heard it mentioned before, but I'm still uncertain about how to do it. <laughs> well, there's a good reason for that. To understand that, you have to be trying it. The intellect doesn't really get that. You have to try. You have to work on examining your own heart and intellect in, in your experiences. So I'll give you an example. How do you normally read a book? Next time you read something, observe yourself. Observe how your own psyche is functioning and how you're viewing that information. We all have habits related to reading. And we have to examine those habits. For the most part, Americans in particular tend to be very intellectual. So when we read, we're reading through the lens of the intellect, which means we're just stuffing the head with ideas. That's why we forget them. And then we become conflicted, because we read a certain idea which contradicts with another idea, and then we enter into conflict. And this is actually probably one of the first causes why people abandon these kinds of studies. Because they've already gathered certain ideas, which aren't their own anyway, but they put value on them. So when they read this type of material and it contradicts it, they can't deal with the conflict, so they walk away, choosing to only live with the ideas that they got first. So not that they're right. It's that those ideas arrived into their mind first, so they believe it first. Some people read emotionally. They read in order to stimulate or experience certain kinds of feelings. And so they're attracted to particular books because of that. For example, romance. Certain people will always long to read these romance books or magazines in order to stimulate the emotional center and feed it with energy. But this is fantasy. It's harmful. Same with movies and TV. We have certain tastes there. We have to learn about that and learn how to balance these centers. As an example, when you read, you should read with all three brains. Not just the intellect. But you have to read in a balanced way. And this is something the Master Samael emphasized many times. Learn to read whatever you're reading, also with the heart. The same applies to music, if you're listening to music. How are you listening? Most of us listen mechanically. We just put music on, and it's playing there, but we're thinking of something else. We might be feeling something else unrelated to the music. This is a contradiction in states and events. When we play music, we should listen to it with all three brains. Of course, physically, the motor instinctive sexual center, we should be relaxed and listening with our ears, right? We should also be having our mind, our intellect, focused into the music, but mostly the heart. Because that music is really designed to stimulate the heart, cultivate and, and help us understand the many subtleties that exist in emotion. So to listen with all three brains, to read with all three brains, this is how we start to balance the heart and mind. And in that way, you will grasp what that means, to think with the heart, to feel with the head. Any other questions? Yes. Is it safe to say that we're living like in hell right now? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter, like, the layers the laws are becoming more and more. And yes. In Gnosis, we... So are we still going? No. We understand that this particular humanity is degenerating rapidly and that, in fact, the earth is descending into the klipoth. The behavior of the human, or the, let's say the intellectual animals, is so grotesque and perverse that we are pulling the klipoth up. We're trying to bring the earth into the klipoth. And you can see that with all the behaviors that we're now celebrating in our culture, in our media and TV, are very degenerated behaviors. Everything. Their sense of humor is extremely cruel. It's all sarcasm. It's all irony, which are forms of violence. And our sense of sexuality has become very corrupted. It's all about animal desire. And you see that that's growing worse from year to year. More and more corrupted. More and more degenerated. 
life in the cities has become unbearably complicated. It's a little easier when you're outside in the country. Things are a little simpler. And you can feel that. When you leave the city, do you feel different? You feel the space around you feels lighter. It feels different. It feels uncomfortable because we're so accustomed to the pressure of the laws, psychological laws in the cities. Some people now can only live in the city. They have become so acclimatized to that degree of complexity, that is the natural vibration of their mind, which is klepotic, related to hell. So you have people in some of the bigger cities that will not leave because they, that's where they feel comfortable, in that little prison. It's very sad. But yes, in Gnosis we do say and, and analyze that this planet and all its development, its civilizations, is sinking into the abyss. We're seeing more and more complexity, more and more difficulty, more and more suffering from year to year. In fact, things that we invent and say this is going to make life better always make it more complicated. Now, on the surface, there might be something that looks better. Like, maybe this part's a little easier, maybe this part's a little better. But if you look deeper, there's more complication. Why is it with all our technology, with all our supposed advancement, are there more and more people on this planet each year who can't get clean water? If we're so technologically advanced, why is there more slavery now than there ever has been? Why is there more starvation? Why is there more disease? This is not advancement. Why is there more conflict, more depression, more suicide, more crime? These things are not going away. They are increasing little by little, year after year, getting worse. And that's because the psyche of, human, of the, this particular race, this particular group, is getting worse. You got a question? Yes. It is true that in these moments there is an enormous potential to awaken the consciousness, but it does not happen mechanically. People have this mistaken notion that all of humanity is naturally evolving. And this is false. There's no evidence for that anywhere. The evidence is quite the opposite. To evolve to become an angel means you have to be rid of pride, rid of lust, rid of envy, rid of fear, rid of doubt. There is an enormous amount of energy available in these times, but unfortunately that energy is pushing downwards, pushing humanity, this human race, into the klipoth. But the nature of tantrism Tantra means continuum or flow. So the nature of the tantric science is to utilize flow of energy, to utilize that continuum of force. But if you just go along, then you will go down. If you just jump into the stream of life, it's going to take you right into the abyss. And that's what's happening. You have to swim against that current. So you have to learn how to take all that energy and invert it. And that's why the basis of the whole science is in transmutation. Because the sexual energy is descending into us from God. And if we keep releasing it, we keep letting that energy flow down into the klipoth. And you can see that in this tree of life. You see the energy flowing down into yasad, the vital body, related to the sexual energy. And it's available in the sexual organs. If you spill it, you fortify the klipoth. That energy flows down, and those rivers, which belong in Eden, invert and become the rivers in hell. So you have to build a dam. You have to build a stop. And gather those forces in order to swim against the current, to fight, to go back up, to 
build the soul, and go against the current of life. There's a lot of help for that. And in these times, if you take advantage of all this energy that's circulating now, you can reach great realizations. But it does not come easily. It does not come automatically. It requires enormous effort. And Jesus said this, very few enter in through that gate because the way is wide and easy that leads to destruction. And that's the way of fornication. It's easy because we're so habituated to that. Any other question? I'm not familiar enough with the, the neural net theory to comment on it. What I can tell you is that the three brains channel the forces related to the law of three. So that provides the potential to create psychologically. But that creation can be positive when that energy is modified and managed by the consciousness. And that creation can be negative when that energy is modified and managed by the ego. It was related to quantum mechanics. I'd have to learn about that to be able to say. You got another question? Um, you talked about the potential to grow and nourish the soul, to birth the soul and nourish the soul, but yet also not emigrate the ego. Um, are there certain, like, is, for instance, sexual transmission? That's a good question. Right. In order to develop the soul, we transmute the sexual energy. In order to destroy the ego, we transmute the sexual energy. Both of those functions are performed by the Divine Mother, not us. As a human soul, as an embryo of a human soul, our job is to be the warrior. And we are there in the battlefield of life to fight against our own mind. The Divine Mother empowers us with armaments. And these are conscious attributes. Self-observation, self-remembering, meditation. But she can only arm us if we transform our sexual energy, if we save it. So that's the ambrosia, right? The amrita, that force of the waters of life that we have to conserve. When we conserve it, the Divine Mother, through her grace, takes those forces and in turn gives us the tools we need. So then we fight. All the while, she is the one who is empowering those weapons that we use against our own mind. The shield and the spear or the sword and the helmet. Those elements that we always see in mythology. All we have to do, transmute, observe, and meditate. Those are the essential factors, right? We don't have to complicate our lives with a lot of different kinds of practices. It's good to experiment with them all and try them all. But the basic essential science is simply that. Transmute, observe, meditate, right? In the act of meditation, in the act of observation, birth and death is happening. When you're transforming your sexual forces, birth and death is happening. It's already happening in you right now. Birth and death is constantly happening. But when you start transforming your sexual energy, you're raising octaves. That energy starts to empower greater levels right, of birth and death. And that's all facilitated by the Divine Mother. So you don't need to worry. Just learn the basic aspects of the practices, experiment with them, and have faith in your Divine Mother. So, for example, a lot of people worry when I'm doing uh, the pranayama or I'm doing vocalization on the chakras and they get very caught up in details. It's not necessary. Because the one who's taking the energy and developing the soul and empowering the chakras is the Divine Mother. She knows very well what she's doing. You need to do your part. We all do. But don't complicate the mind. 
don't complicate the mind. Do your practices, experiment, but don't complicate with a lot of theories. Just do the practices. And little by little, you gain experience in these things. You start to see that. You had a question? Well, I guess related to the previous question, in the case of Andrew Malek, there was some reason or something that made him uh, you know, make mistakes. I guess if you don't fight in the right way, you don't end up destroying the ego. And that's why it's possible to create the solar body and also not destroy the ego. So you didn't, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't put the willpower in the right way. The Master Samael states in the Peace of Sophia unveiled that many people fight very hard for their self-realization, but in the wrong way. So that's why it's, it's very important to study. But that study has to be accompanied by meditation. We have to meditate deeply and understand the science. But meditation really, the, the receptive mind that can receive the guidance of the being is what's important here. The being will never lead us into error. Only our own mind will, our ego. So we need to develop that capacity to receive his guidance. And if we don't receive it, to wait. There are many subtle things in the mind that can deceive an initiate at every level of the path. And the more you advance, the more you, you are, are accelerating or reaching up, the more subtle the mind becomes and the more dangerous. And that's why the Master Samael stated that the closer you become, the closer you are to becoming an angel, the more danger there is of becoming a demon. And it's due to the mind. So it requires restraint, self-analysis, and sincerity. Always be sincere with oneself. He gives many examples of initiates who transmute the sexual energy, who teach, study, and learn gnosis, but who awaken in evil. And it can be as simple as not recognizing self-will. Because self-will can be easily confused with the will of God. Because we're trying to develop individual will, right? Human will. The human soul, which is that extension, that warrior, which fights on behalf of the innermost. But it's difficult to perceive the difference between human will, the will of God, and self-will. And many initiates fall into that mistake. So it's super important to never take your experiences for granted. Never take them at face value. Even if you meditate on something and you have an experience about it, even if you have an astral projection and you have some profound experience, do not assume it's true. Because that is the doorway through which demons are created, like Andra Malek. Gnostic Radio is made possible through the financial support of listeners like you. To make a tax-deductible donation, visit our website at GnosticTeachings.org. For questions about this or other lectures, we invite you to participate in the free discussion forum at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy. Yeah.